How we doing everybody? Welcome back to Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. As I film this video, it's May 7th, so, you know, we got like a thousand days left until the season actually kicks off, give or take. About 900 days. But the NFL Draft wrapped up last week. Uh, the majority of free agents have signed, so we have a pretty good idea about all the rosters, about which position battles are going to be going on, and you know, it's time to start analyzing for the draft for your fantasy football draft. Today we're gonna get into some of my favorite sleepers. And as always, I mention each year, sleepers are not people that you haven't heard of because in today's day and age, there's just too many articles, too much info out there that you're never gonna go into a draft not hearing of someone that might be good in the fantasy football world. So when I mean sleepers, I mean people that are very undervalued in the draft. Where they're going in the draft is way lower than they should be. Thus, they could provide you a lot of value. Thus, stay asleep. All the information, all the numbers, all the ADP, the average draft position that I'm going to be touching on in this video is coming from a site called My Fantasy League. A lot of you guys might know it as MFL 10, MFL 25. They're getting very popular. And all these leagues are cash leagues. They're prizes. You pay to get into them. So the people that are drafting are actually drafting seriously. They're not drafting like... Robert Griffin III in the first round, they're they're playing they're playing for money, so the ADPs are real. Also, should be noted that all the MFL 10 leagues are PPR format, full point PPR format, and they are best ball formats, which means you draft the team and you don't set the lineup throughout the year. It automatically picks the highest performing player each week and it puts that into the position. So PPR players are going to be a little more skewed in these drafts, so their ADP is, as well as guys with really high ceilings and low floors, like say like a Ted Ginn, because you don't actually have to decide whether you want to start them or not. If they have a big week, they're pretty much inserted into the lineup automatically. So just keep that in mind as I'm going through these ADPs. Without further ado, let's get into my top eight early fantasy sleepers for 2017 fantasy football. And I'm going to be doing this, I'll probably do an update each month. So May, June, July, August, leading up to the draft. So here's my earliest one. Let's get into it. All right, so we're going to kick it off in the wide receiver position. Number one guy, Jordy Nelson. Again, obviously, he's not a sleeper, but in terms of where he's getting drafted, right now he's going 15 overall as the eighth wide receiver off the board. Makes no sense to me. Last year, he was wide receiver number one in fantasy football. He had that injury in 2015. A lot of people questioned him coming into last year. I was one of them. Totally proved us wrong, took a shit on our chest, and proved that he is still an elite fantasy option. Again, wide receiver one. Playing with Aaron Rodgers, the best quarterback in football. Their chemistry is unrivaled when it comes to the NFL quarterback wide receiver spectrum. He led the league in touchdowns with 14. He was the most targeted wide receiver in the red zone. He was the most targeted wide receiver in the 10-yard line, something that's been consistent throughout his career when he plays with Aaron Rodgers. No reason whatsoever to believe that those targets and those numbers are going to change going into next year. You could easily argue that Jordy Nelson has the highest floor of any receiver in fantasy football. Probably, probably Antonio Brown will hold that crown, but... Jordy Nelson's a very close second, and I don't think there's any reason why he shouldn't be the, the next wide receiver off the board after Antonio, Odell, and Julio. The eighth wide receiver off the board is just ridiculous. He's actually going after T.Y. Hilton. Just let that sink in for a second. Next up, wide receiver number two. We're moving over to Chi-Town, and we got my boy Cameron Meredith. Getting picked 81st overall as wide receiver 41. He was wide receiver 29 on a points per game basis. Now, obviously the quarterback situation is just a shit show over there in Chicago, as well as the wide receiver position and, and that depth chart. And I think when all is said is done, Cameron Meredith will definitely, you know, he's the cream, he's gonna rise to the top. 66 catches, 888 yards. Um, didn't get a lot of opportunity there, and I think there's so much room to grow. He was actually one of nine wide receivers in the NFL last year that had at least five weeks as a wide receiver one in fantasy. That's pretty impressive. Five individual weeks as a wide receiver one in fantasy. Meredith is only 24 years old. He's built like he's built like Alshon Jeffrey. He's 6'3", he's big, 210, huge wingspan, huge hands, can go up, 
get balls, can win jump balls, can win contested catches, same speed as a guy like Alshon Jeffrey. And over the last four weeks of the season, Cameron Meredith was wide receiver two in fantasy football behind only Jordy Nelson. There's a ton of potential for this guy. His talent is there. The raw physical tools are there. We just have to make sure or hope that the quarterback situation can play itself out there between Mike Lennon and Trubisky. Uh, it's almost definitely going to have Mike Lennon starting at least uh, to begin the year. And when you look at Mike Lennon's rookie season, the, the season that he played pretty well and the reason that he's even probably given a chance in the NFL still, he basically locked on to Vincent Jackson, who was his wide receiver one and force fed him targets. Uh, so he, he relied heavily on his wide receiver one as well as his tight end. So I like the prospect of Cameron Meredith being the wide receiver one there in Chicago and getting a lot of, uh, getting a lot of opportunity with Glennon throwing him the ball. Next, third wide receiver on the sleeper list. Another guy who had a very good year quietly, made a free agent move this offseason. That's Pierre Garcon out of Washington into San Francisco, now with the 49ers. Currently the 90th pick overall, wide receiver 44. When you look at the Niners, they have Brian Hoyer chucking the pigskin. They signed Matt Barkley as well. Uh, Hoyer should be the starter there. But what's intriguing about Pierre Garcon on top of the year that he had last year, which was um, which was pretty good. He went over 1,000 a thousand yards. He had 1,041 yards, I think. Um, caught 80 passes. And now he's being reunited with Kyle Shanahan, the, obviously the former offensive coordinator in Atlanta, took over as a head coach in, in San Francisco this offseason. Now, Kyle Shanahan has that X receiver in his offense. That X receiver has been fantasy gold no matter where he goes. And Pierre Garçon, back in 2013, was that X receiver for Shanahan when they were together in Washington. That year, Garçon caught 113 balls for 1,346 yards. He only scored five touchdowns, but regardless, those numbers are 113 balls. Now, you look, you look at the makeup of that 49ers offense, they have no weapons on the outside. Pierre Garçon is by default the wide receiver one there, will be the X receiver in that offense. Ryan Hoyer typically feeds his wide receiver one a lot of targets. So even if Garçon is not as effective as an older player, he's going to get a ton of looks, going to catch a ton of balls. Probably won't score a lot just due to the offense and the nature of that offense. But in a PPR league, he's an absolute steal this year. He gives you like a perfect wide receiver three floor with some wide receiver two upside if he could see enough volume. And he's currently being picked as a wide receiver four to five. So I love Pierre Garçon going into this year. He'll probably be on the majority of my PPR teams. All right, we're going to move over from the wide receiver position to the running back spots. And the first guy up on my list is rookie running back, not Fournette, not McCaffrey, Joey Mixon, baby. As you all know, a lot of off the field issues, but it just took one team to take a chance on him. That was Cincinnati Bengals. And now he is going off the board overall 47th pick in fantasy drafts as running back number 20. Uh, you guys have heard all there is to hear about him this offseason outside of the off the field altercations. The talent level is elite in every sense of the word. The only comparisons you hear about this dude are like David Johnson, Le'Veon Bell, at worst, a Matt Forte. So the talent is very real. When you watch him play, it's he jumps off the screen. It's like it's unbelievable. So I am a hundred percent believer in his talent. Now Interesting when you look at the situation, because they obviously have Jeremy Hill there. They obviously have Gio Bernard there. That's a mix of like a power and a, a, a pass catching back, something that Joe Mixon can do both of. 6'1", 225 pounds. Like you can't get a more prototypical built, prototypically built running back than him. Um, he runs a 4'4", 340. The guy can literally do it all. It's unbelievable. He can, he can block. He could... He's like a wide receiver coming out of the backfield. It's probably his most valuable fantasy asset is the fact that he's amazing at catching the ball. So the way I look at it is this this move by the Bengals basically makes, I, I like halfway through the summer, maybe by the week one, Mixon's going to be the starter there. No, no question in my mind. This makes Jeremy Hill irrelevant in the fantasy landscape. Um, Jeremy Hill, is, it's multiple years of disappointing seasons for him. This is his last year on the contract for the Bengals, so drafting Mixon was just replacing Hill. 
uh, following 2017. Gio is battling back from an ACL tear, uh, so he obviously has, to, has a long road of recovery. He has to get back from that injury successfully. So Mixon has a prime opportunity here to take over that starting spot and just run away with it. He has that, that Le'Veon Bell 20-25 touch build, um, stamina, production. It's all there. All he needs to do is take over that role and run with it. Now, Gio is still going to play a role for sure. He's been an asset to that Bengals team for a long time. He's caught a lot of balls in his career, and I don't think they're going to just you know spell him out of the offense. I do think he's going to eat into Mixon's PPR value, um, but... You know, the Bengals are going to be a good offense this year. They have a lot of weapons, so they're going to be moving the ball. They're going to get plenty of scoring opportunities. So I see Mixon as the early down back. I see Mixon as the goal line back. And I see him getting a good probably 40, 30, between 35 and 45 receptions. So between him and Gio, I think they'll, they'll catch 80 to 90 balls. So there's plenty of value to go around there. And I think Mixon is just like a steal at RB20 because I think he could legitimately put up like top eight numbers at the position. Next up, my man's beast mode. Going 57th overall, running back 23. So he's not even in the RB2 conversation unless you're in a 12-team league. I guess he would be. But this is incredible to me. I wrote a whole article and I did a whole video just on the return of Marshawn Lynch. So if you haven't seen that, you can go check that out. I'll link it here um, where I, I went in much greater depth. But my take on this is I, I understand he's old and he's and he's coming off a long break, but he's coming into one of the best offenses in the NFL. He's running behind the top rank run blocking line in the NFL in Oakland. Anyone not named Latavius Murray last year averaged 5.6 yards per carry behind that line. He'll get all the goal line opportunities. He should get the majority of early down work. Obviously, he's not going to be the best receiver, but that's never been what brings value to his owners in fantasy. So I'm not worried about that. Um, when you look at him coming off that long break, I think the best precedent we have there is looking at Adrian Peterson, that year of 2015. He had about a year break in between the games that he played. And he was 30 at the time, by the time he came back, and he rushed for, I think, like 1,500 yards, 12 touchdowns. Um, obviously, you know, they're they're different players, but I, they're both beasts. They're both cut from the same cloth. I think the ground and pound that he took for the last, like, five years of his career, Marshawn, I, I think the rest was good for him, to be honest. I think he's ready to roll. He's excited to get back in there, and I think he's going to kill shit in Oakland. And when you look at it, like, it's not, you, I don't think Lynch needs to have... 300 plus carries in order to put up really good numbers. Latavius Murray last year had 195 carries and finished as running back 13 in fantasy. 195 carries. So give give Beast Mode 220 carries. He'll get 10 goal line scores. I, I the fact that he's going as RB 23, 24 is crazy to me. I think he should be in the in like the top 12 to 15 conversation if not even higher and again like receiving is not a strong point obviously he never has been but he's averaged about 30 catches a year since his rookie year and Latavius Murray had I think 33 catches last year so there's no reason he can't replicate that um, even if the guy you know Jalen Richard and DeAndre Washington take over the the pass catching role there permanently he still should be involved so, you know, I, I like Marshawn a lot more than most people do. I see a big year out of beast mode, man. I don't know how you can count, count like, how can you l go against him? Running back numero three, we have Danny Head of Wood out in Baltimore. He's being picked 89th overall as running back 32. Surprised he moved teams, to be honest with you. He was such a big piece of that Chargers offense when he was healthy. He's been so good for them. And now he's going to step in and be, well... First off, you, you got to look at Kenneth Dixon. What they already have there is Kenneth Dixon, who's suspended for the first four games, which is a third of the fantasy season. And then you have Terrence West. So Dixon's out for the first four games, which means Danny Woodhead should see an easy 15-plus touches in all those um, first four games. And I think he's an easy... He's a high-end RB2, if not an RB1 in PPR leagues, without a doubt, for those first four weeks. Um, you know, they didn't, you could see last year, they didn't use Terrence West on a full workload at any point. They, the coaching staff clearly doesn't like trust him other than like one or two games. He had big carries, but he, they don't see him as the franchise back. They don't see him as the workhorse there. Um, and I, I would see Danny Wood getting way more touches than him when Kenneth Dixon's gone. I mean, when Kenneth Dixon returns, there's no doubt that he's going to play a big role in that running, um, 
in that running situation. I, I still think Danny Woodhead gets the majority of of the pass catching work there in Baltimore. You look at what what they do in that offense, over 20% of their passing targets went to running backs last year. So that's a good chunk. Um, if you know if Joe Flacco throws the ball 600 times, 125 of them are going to running backs. So Woodhead should see, you know, um, 75, 80 targets. And a lot of that has to do with Marty Morningwig. I forget how to say his name as the, uh, you know, as a play caller there. I have the stat. I'm going to read it to you. So during his career as the offensive coordinator, Morningwig's offenses have finished overall in the NFL, first, second, fourth, fifth, ninth, and twelfth. So regardless of the offense, he always finds a way to make things happen there. And uh, I think Woodhead's going to gain a lot from being in that offense. And I'm excited to see what he can do. Like I said, I think he's going to play a huge role. If nothing else, you're getting high-end RB2, low-end RB1 for the first four weeks of the season. And he's still going to play a role going later on, but you're able to draft him as an RB4, an RB5. He's consistently underrated. He always is. So, All right, the fourth and final running back on my fantasy sleeper list. And these are not in any particular order. I mean, they are in order in terms of where they're getting drafted, but not in terms of who I like more than others. And this guy might actually be my favorite sleeper given the value at his draft position. And it's Darren Sproles out in Philly. Currently going 150 overall, running back 41. Now, I know it's early, obviously, so a lot of these ADPs will eventually work themselves out and they'll get a little more crisp as the summer goes on, but the fact that he is even starting at this is ridiculous to me. It's ridiculous. The people of America need to understand what Darren Sproles has to offer. Sproles, Ryan Matthews. We still don't know what's going on with Ryan Matthews, if you're going to get cut or not. Uh, they have Wendell Smallwood, who was a rookie last year. A lot of reporters are still saying Ryan Matthews gets cut. Ryan Matthews had 35% of the Eagles' carries last year. It's proven that he can't stay healthy. It, you know, you know what you're getting out of Matthews in, in that role. And that Eagles line, uh, they boast, you know, a, a pretty good run-blocking line. They uh, Football Outsiders ranked their O-line as the 13th best run-blocking line in the NFL last year. So they have a strong line, whoever's running the ball. And I think Sproles is by far the most valuable back in that backfield right now. If Matthews gets cut, Darren Sproles should be an easy RB2 in this offense. A lot of beat reporters are saying Sproles is going to be the guy there. He's going to get the most touches. And you could you could see that at the end of the season towards like this the middle to the second half of last year. He was getting the most touches. Obviously, he's not that normal... 20 carry a guy game, but they manufacture touches for him. He's never gone in a single season in his entire NFL career. He's never gone under 700 total yards, four touchdowns, 40 receptions. So that's minimum floor. And I want to read off these numbers. These are his, his PPR running back finishes starting in 2016 and going back. So 2016, 15, 14, RB 24, RB 28, RB 24, RB 23, RB 13, RB 5. So at worst, you're getting a low-end RB2, right? Like, those are his worst finishes over the last six years. Twenty RB28 was his worst finish. And he's being drafted as RB41. And now I see even more opportunity in the Eagles offense. They know what they have in him. Hopefully, I, I'm hoping Matthews gets cut just for Sproles' sake. He's a guy who catches a million balls. And that offense should be a lot better this year. They have a lot of weapons. And he's going to play a big key role there. I mean, the Eagles drafted a guy, Danell Pumphrey, who's literally like a a poor man's Darren Sproles, so I don't know what, why they did that, but I don't know. I, I just really like Sproles, other, just for the fact that he's just super underrated, always. And he always finishes in that, you know, in that 20 to 25 range, at worst, so. Okay, so that wraps up running backs, that wraps up wide receivers. We're going to move over to tight end for my last and final sleeper on the list right now, and that is Jack Doyle. I covered him in the free agency tight end edition uh, video that I did, so I'll link that here. And I love this dude. He'll probably be my tight end on every team I can get him on, especially if he's at this value. He's getting picked 128th overall as tight end 14, which is just retarded. In my in my eyes, he's a guaranteed tight end one. He got re-signed in Indy. Dwayne Allen is out of there. And the, the big thing here is even when Dwayne Allen was there and taking a lot of targets and a lot of red zone targets, Doyle finished as tight end 12, catching, what was it, 59 balls for 584 yards and five touchdowns. So he was tight end 12 last year with Dwayne Allen there. Dwayne Allen leaves, and now he's being picked as tight end 14. 
I don't get it. This ADP will almost certainly work itself out. But even if he starts getting picked as like tight end eight or nine, I see that as his floor in this offense. You look at the combination of what Doyle and Allen did together as the tight end position in the Indy Colt offense. They combined for 94 catches, almost 1,000 yards, and 11 touchdowns. And that does not include Eric Swoop and his 15 catches for 300 yards and a touchdown. So if Doyle can take over Allen's production, even if he doesn't, even if he takes over a good portion of that and then still gives some to Eric Swoop, Doyle is a guaranteed tight end one, like top eight. You have to think of Andrew Luck and how much he loves using the tight ends. It's, it, it was some, let me see, it's 33% of his touchdowns over the last three years have gone to tight ends. He uses them in the red zone like no one else. And you know, Luck is, a fully healthy Luck, which he should be this year, is basically a guaranteed 30, 35 touchdowns, guaranteed 40, 400 passing yards, if not more, it's a higher ceiling there. And I think that the tight end position there just gets so much of that production that it's it's almost impossible to go wrong with him. The floor is so high and the ceiling is unknown, which is a good combination in fantasy football. So those are my eight guys. And there's more that I like, so stay tuned for the ones that are coming up in the in, in the coming months. And in a lot of my articles that I post on my website or the other videos, you can kind of get a feel for who I like and who I even like as sleepers. Basically, just, just given how I talk about them in those videos. Um, I didn't do any quarterbacks in this video because I'm just looking at the ADP list and quarterback value is just fucking everywhere. You know, like Starting at Tom Brady as quarterback three, ridiculous with all the weapons now with Brandon Cooks. You have Matt Ryan as quarterback 7, Kirk Cousins as quarterback 11, uh, and then you have Dak as quarterback 12, and you have Big Ben, Matt Stafford, and Tyrod Taylor all going far after those guys. So, like, you can wait till, like, your last round and get a good quarterback this year. So I don't even, I don't really want to waste time talking about them as sleepers because there's values all over the board at those spots. Um, but, yeah, that's going to wrap up the vid. If you enjoyed, if you thought it was good information, valuable, you want to argue, you want to put some of your sleepers, go comment that down below. Give the vid a thumbs up if you liked and you want to see more things like this. If Let me know what kind of other uh, styles of fantasy football videos you want to do. Right now, what I'm doing is I am writing up blog posts, which I will do a video for each one of them. Every single NFL team, all 32 teams, an individual write-up for their fantasy football outlook. So I'm going to go through the quarterbacks, the running situation, the wide receivers and tight ends. And I'm about 12 to 14 articles in already. Um, I haven't posted any of them, but I'm going to combine. I'm going to collect all of them. Once I'm finished, I'm going to be posting them probably daily for about 30 straight days and do a video each time for each of those. So there's going to be a ton of information through that. If you're looking for specific players or teams, you can easily find them in those videos and blogs. Um, so there's a ton of shit I'm going to be doing this summer to help you guys prepare for your drafts. And if you're not following me on Twitter, I have a Twitter specifically for fantasy football. It's B-D-G-E-A-T, fantasy. So at Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy, abbreviated of course. And I'll put it here. I'll link everything else in the description. Again, if you're new and you enjoyed, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. And remember, Big Dogs Gotta Eat. <laughs> See you next time. I'm seven on Bella. My chick from Bella. My whip from Germany. I'm cooler than LL. I'm sipping on Bella. My chick from Bella. My whip from Germany. I'm cooler than LL. I got my nigga like Patty Cake.